Hi, my name is Sarah Doss and I'm a glaciologist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And a glaciologist means that I'm someone who studies glaciers and ice sheets. West Antarctica and Greenland is where I do most of my work. The Greenland ice sheet is the largest ice sheet after Antarctica. And Greenland in particular is, is quite sensitive to climate warming and to climate change. And as this as the ice sheet melts and flows more quickly, the water that was held on land is now going back into the sea, which allows sea level to rise globally. The ice sheet holds um, enough water that if the entire ice sheet were to melt, it would raise the global sea level by over seven meters. We know that ice is melting on the surface and running off, and we also know that the ice is, is sliding out. It's sliding along the bed and flowing out under its own weight, and, and ice is lost that way. What's going on beneath the ice is very important to dictating how quickly the ice itself is flowing. And if the ice sheet is frozen at its, bot, at its bed, frozen to the bedrock underneath, then it will flow much more slowly than if it's wet, if it has a lubricating layer underneath. What we set about to do was to try to understand how you might be able to get the surface meltwater all the way to the bottom of the ice sheet in these thick cold ice areas. And one idea that we had was that in regions of the ice sheet where you have meltwater lakes, what are called superglacial lakes. They pool and collect meltwater throughout the summer and you could use that pool of water to actually drive a fracture, drive a crack down through the ice sheet in a process called hydrofracture um, and drain all of that meltwater to the base of the ice sheet. So when you put more water underneath the ice sheet, you, um, you do two things. You create a more lubricating layer, so you, you reduce the friction, which allows the, um, the ice sheet to flow more easily across the bedrock, rough bedrock surface. And you also increase the water pressure underneath the ice sheet, which is sort of like you know, blowing up a cushion underneath or a, um, a you know, whoopee cushion or something like that, that, that allows the, um, the ice to flow more quickly out to, its, to the sea. We knew from satellite observations that large lakes, well any lakes, could drain in the matter of one or two days, which is the shortest observation period that the satellite data gave us. An important question is how do we know where the water went? How quickly did the lake drain? Um, what process did it occur by? Do we know where the water went? What was the ice sheet response? We set out our instruments in the summer of 2006 while our two study lakes were actually full of water. So we had a boat at the time um, and we set loggers in the lake to monitor lake level as well as um, GPS sensors and seismometers around the lake. And then after the team left in uh, late July 2006, um, they left everything on site and we came back again in the summer of 2007 in around the same time of year. And it turned out that one of our study lakes had, had drained during the study period and one of them had not. Um, and the lake that had drained, in fact, had drained at the end of July of 2006 and then had filled again in July 2007 and drained again before we even got back there. So we have very um, well constrained records of two rapid drainages of that one particular study lake. So from these, from the data recorded in those instruments, we knew that as the water level was draining at the same time, the surface of the ice sheet was actually um, moving quite rapidly. While we've been able to determine from our results so far that the lakes are draining very quickly and that the water is getting to the bed and there's some effect on the ice sheet flow, um, we still have a lot of unanswered questions about the actual dynamics of that process, how it's happening, how quickly the crack itself is moving down through the ice, how extensive the crack is, how long it is as it moves through the ice. I find that I'm there for such a short period of time, it's such an opportunity to just um, you know, keep on investigating, keep on exploring, that I, you know, I find myself charging pretty hard from you know, 6 or 7 a.m. till 11 or 12 at night. And um, it's because there's just always something else that you want to see or explore. There's you know, another bend in the stream you want to see, or there's another side of the lake you want to hike to, or um, there's another bit of data that you can't wait to analyze right there sitting in your tent. Um, so I tend to keep on going. One thing that contributes to that is that it's light 24 hours a day, and so you don't have the natural rhythm of you know, the sun going down in darkness to say, well, maybe we should stop now and play some Scrabble and you know, <laughs> call it a night.
This podcast was produced by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution with funding from the National Science Foundation. For more information, visit us on the web at polardiscovery.whoi.edu.